the promise that was withheld from the Old Testament is the Spirit. And where does the Spirit now dwell? In my temple. So the Spirit wasn't dwelling in a temple that was made with hands. A Spirit wasn't dwelling in something that had the inner court, the outer court. These were types. These were shadows. But somebody say the Spirit dwells in my temple. I don't live by faith in God. I live by the faith of God. So, so, so wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me say that again. I don't live by faith in God. I live by the faith of God. So it's no longer about my faith in him. It's about his faith in me. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, right now. Because I don't thank you in advance. I look back at what you have done. I thank you late because you have done it in the spirit. And I have it now. Somebody say, my position is better. You are unchangeable. This morning is somebody ready for the word this morning amen Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen for by it the elders obtained a good testimony by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now let's jump down to verse 39. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us. Somebody say something better for us. Something better for us. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. I want to preach on the subject this morning saying, I have something better. Someone say, I have something better. Now, the context of Hebrews 11 is a, is a very famous scripture. It's the, the hall of faith. It's just talking about everyone in the Old Testament that used faith for one thing or the other to do great exploits. But when we jump down to verse 39, at the end of the hall of faith, what it says is that all these, Moses, Elijah, Joshua, all these people that use faith in the Old Testament, they, what they did is that they obtained a good testimony through faith, but they didn't receive the promise. But again, verse 40, God having provided something better for us. Someone say something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So what we're going to establish this morning is what is that promise in verse 39? And again, in verse 40, what is those things which are better for us? What are those things that were better for us? And what is that promise? Amen. Is, am I communicating with someone this morning? Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. So 
In order to understand what the promise is, we need to understand the desire of God through the Old Testament. I said that Hebrews 11 is talking about the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, talking about all those people that did whatever they did, used faith for exploits and all those things. Now, we need to understand the desire of God. Now, I'm going to give you the context. A desire of God through the Old Testament is that he was looking for one specific thing. He was looking for a house. Everybody say a house. So God was looking for a house. And let me give, let me give you these, um, the, the, the context to what I'm talking about. In Genesis chapter 28, there were, there were thereabouts, Jacob saw an angel, saw um, a vision. And in this vision were these angels descending and ascending. He pours oil on the stone and says, this will be the house of God. But God couldn't live in that stone. A stone doesn't have the capacity to house God. The next person that God was looking for to build a house was uh, Moses, the tabernacle of Moses. And it was consisted of, you know, the inner court, the outer court, the holy of holies. And with all the ornaments and the precious stones and the gold that Moses used to create this house, God couldn't live in the house. The glory filled the temple, but he couldn't live in that house. That house did, still didn't have the capacity to house God. The next person God goes to is David. God asks David, look, I, I need a house. And he, and he says, but it's not going to come from you. It's going to come from your, li your lineage, the temple of Solomon. So we ask Solomon, look, I, I need a house. And, and, and um, Solomon builds the temple of Solomon. But still, this house still couldn't, it couldn't house God. Because the temple of Solomon didn't have the capacity to house God. Someone say something better for us. So now we're going to Zerubbabel, the temple of Zerubbabel. And God is saying now, look, 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 okay, we've had Jacob, we've had um, Solomon, we've had Moses. They've all built temples, but I, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. Let me show you this. The house that I'm looking for, it's not going to be by power or by might. It's not going to be by blocks or cement. It's going to be made by my spirit. But Zerubbabel didn't understand and still went and built a temple. And it still didn't have the capacity to house God. So God goes to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Isaiah 66, verse 1. God asks Isaiah, look, look what he asks. He says, that says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Next bit. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is my place of rest. Now, Isaiah must have been terribly confused. Look, you've had, God, you've had the temple of Solomon. You've had the tabernacle of Moses. You've had the temple of Zerubbabel. You've had Jacob. Paul. What, what house are you looking for? I don't understand the house that you were looking for. But it was revelation knowledge that Isaiah couldn't bear at that time period. So now we get to John chapter 2. And... The Pharisees are questioning Jesus and they're saying, now what are those signs that we may know that it is you? And he says, destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. But they didn't understand what he was saying. Destroy this temple? This temple was built over 46 years. How are you going to build it back up in three days? But it was revelation knowledge. Somebody said revelation knowledge. That Jesus was speaking. He wasn't speaking about a temple that is made with hands. He's not looking for a temple that is made with hands. The temple of the Lord is the body of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the temple of the Lord is Jesus' body. Now, Jesus died the first day, buried on the second day, rose again on the third day, so that we can say, know ye not, our body is the temple of the Holy God. So whose body is the temple now? Our body. So our body is that house that God was asking Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 66. Amen? So let's go back to Hebrews 11. So I said that that all of these people were in faith. They had faith, but they didn't inherit the promise. Now, what is the promise? I had to go to the temple. I had to give you the temple so that you could understand the promise. Because there's a connection between the temple and the promise. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. 
Everybody say this. Christ, three, two, one. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, the Gentiles are us in Christ Jesus, that we might receive, now what is the promise? The promise of the Spirit through faith. So the promise that was withheld from the Old Testament is the spirit. And where does the spirit now dwell? In my temple. So the spirit wasn't dwelling in a temple that was made with hands. A spirit wasn't dwelling in something that had the inner court, the outer court. These were types. These were shadows. But somebody say the spirit dwells in my temple. So now I am the carrier of God. I am the, I'm the, 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 all of the Holy Spirit lives in me. The Holy Spirit is my abode, my residence. I'm the corporate headquarters of all of God right now in the name of Jesus. And someone's got to believe that tonight, this morning. Amen. So the Spirit dwells in the temple. Just quickly, let me, let me quickly show you what I was talking about with the temple and, you know, building it and things like that. Acts chapter 7, verse 43. The Spirit dwells in the temple. The Spirit didn't want to dwell in a temple that was, that was built, constructed by might and power. That's not what the Spirit... It says, it, um, Acts chapter 7, yeah. You also took up the tabernacle of and the star of your God, images which, which you made to worship. Verse 44. Actually, wait, I'll come back to that. But in Acts chapter 7, it says that I do not dwell in, ta- in temples and tabernacles that are made with hands. So God wasn't looking for something that was made with hands, with might and power. He was looking for someone that was available that could yield himself to the Spirit. Amen. Now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 13. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. If we go to that. Verse 14 again. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, us, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through what? Through faith. Now, the blessing of the Spirit only comes by faith. Am I communicating with someone this morning? Are you getting what I'm saying? The blessing of the Spirit, so the blessing of the Spirit comes from faith. So the Spirit only comes, is attracted to faith. So, now, this, that poses a, a, a specific question. Hebrews 11 was showing all of these people in the Old Testament that were walking by faith, doing things by faith. But they were doing it by faith. But why didn't they get the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit? Because it says that the promise of the Spirit is through faith, Right? So that, it doesn't make any sense. So now I will show you what are those better things in verse 40. The Bible said in verse 40 that there are something better for us. And that better for us is why the spirit is connected to our faith and not their faith. Am, is, am, I, am I communicating with someone? Is someone understanding? So we have faith. We have a faith that is different to those of the, old, of the people of the old. And therefore, the Holy Spirit wants to connect with that faith and not the faith that they had. Now, let me show you why. Galatians, no, no, no. Before we go to Galatians 2.20, because I'm going to get there. Before we get to Galatians 2.20, it is important to understand what was the faith of the Old Testament? What was the faith of the Old Testament? So the people, the people that had faith in the Old Testament, it, like Romans 4 there and thereabouts. It says that Moses believed God, or other times they say, believed in God, and it was accounted to him righteousness. Makes sense. But Moses believed in God, and it was accredited to him righteousness. So Moses got what he got by believing in God. Same with Joshua. Same with um, Elijah. Same with um, Solomon. Same with Rahab. Same with all these people. They believed in God. And that's how they got what they got. But someone say something better for us. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. And this is important. Because when I understood that, it redefined my Christian life and what I knew about faith. It redefined everything. Galatians 2.20 in the KJV. 
Everybody say, to, say with me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. In the Son of God. So, so, what, wait, 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 wait. so I don't live by faith in God. I live by the faith of God. So, so, so wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me say that again. I don't live by faith in God. I live by the faith of God. So it's no longer about my faith in him. It's about his faith in me. So it's not about what I can muster up with my own strength. It's not about what I can conjure up for God. No, 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 no. It's about what he has deposited inside of me. It's about what lives on me now. So my faith is not about, Lord, I'm believing in you for my bills to be paid. It's no, 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 no. God's faith in me will attract the investment that is needed for my bills to be paid. It's not that, Lord, I'm believing and I'm working, oh, Lord, for, for, for you to bless me with a new house. No, 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 no. Somebody is going to come and say, I don't know why, but we're leaving this town right now and we have a vacant house. And because the faith of God is inside of you, and there is something peculiar about you. I think you should just become the new resident of this home. Somebody say, the faith of God is inside of me. And that's what I'm saying. It's very peculiar, the faith of God. The, the faith of God. So, and an example that I always want like to use is um, Bishop. When, um, I haven't lived a long time, so I can't use a lot of examples about my life. That's yeah. <laughs> so, when I, so when I use, so, so, when, so testimonies, I might have to use Bishop's testimonies or something like that. I remember when Bishop said on the Watch Night service, he said, look, he, who was he banking with at the time? Was it Nick Nationwide, Nat West? Nat West? And he said, look, he said, um, look, he was, he was paying checks and just stepping out in faith, and he was paying, um, pay, like, sending checks and things, and it would just be bouncing. And they closed his account. And he said, one day they're going to come back to me. And that's the, that's the faith of God that I'm talking about. Then they came to his office and said, Hello. We want, to bank, we, want to, we want you to bank with us. And that's what I'm saying. It's not about you believing and conjuring up what you can do for God. It's God seeing you and depositing what he needs in you. And that thing, it just attracts that what you are in need of. It attracts it. Someone say, I have a faith magnet. And it's called the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. So, the first thing that I said, there's something better for us, was the indwelling of the Spirit, right? The first thing was the indwelling of the Spirit. The second thing that was better for us was the, it was our faith has been upgraded. So, what was the first thing? And then what was the second thing? So, the third thing now the third thing that is better for us that I want to talk about is our position. Somebody say our position. Our position is now better. Our position. Now, what does that mean? Come with me to Isaiah 53, verse 1. I'm, you might need to zoom out, Mr. Cameraman, or Mrs. Cameraman, because I'm going to be doing a lot of walking for this demonstration. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 to verse 10. So, let me give you the context of what's going on here in Isaiah 53. Isaiah is seeing a vision in the future of what God will do. He's seeing a vision in the future of what God will do. And he's reporting on it. He's reporting on it. And he's, and he's not too sure about what he is seeing, if I'm going to be honest. He's just writing it down. He's writing it down. So when we get to verse 1, it says, now, who's going to believe our report? What God is showing me in the future, from the future, this vision, who is going to believe it? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as root 
out of dry ground. Now he's talking about Jesus now. He has no form of comeliness. And when he, we see him, he has no beauty. So Jesus came to this earth. He, God poured out Jesus into this earth, not as someone that was in, as we would say, he wasn't peng. He wasn't good looking. He had no form of comeliness. He wasn't, he wasn't a great looking guy. He was just an ordinary guy. And it says that we should not even desire him. Now, verse 3 um, Azira is now going to show us a picture of the cross. It's going to show us a picture of the cross. But the first three, he's saying, now, if you look at this with your physical eyes, if you look at this with your physical eyes, this is what you see. He was despised. He is despised and rejected by man, men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it, and we hid as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let's just stop there. So as I was saying, look, 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 if you look with your physical eyes, this is what you will see. A man that was isolated, a man dejected, a man rejected, a man disposed of on the cross. If you look physically, that's what you'll see. And disclaimer, that's what they saw on the road to Emmaus. That's what those people saw. They thought, oh, you know, he didn't rise again. We're upset. He didn't come the way that we, were, he, we thought he was going to come. Those two apostles, if you, if you remember that story, he didn't come the way we, we thought he was going to come. He was just hanging on that tree, despised and rejected. But somebody say verse 4. Verse 4. Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. That, that griefs and sorrows is our pains and our sicknesses. So he bore them in his body. And, and then verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, of what, uh, also known as what I deserved, what you deserved, what we had conjured up in our sin, he took it, and that, and that is the chastisement of our peace. He took it, and by his stripes, we are healed. Now, as I was saying all of this based off of what God has done, God will do, God will do, God will do in a vision that God is showing him. Am I communicating with someone? So Isaiah is looking and, and, and God is showing him. So I, I'm not sure what's going on, but I know. But based off of what is going to happen, uh, we are healed. We are healed. We are healed. So 1 Peter 2.24, let me show you. I said, what was the, the something better for us? The third one. Our position. Our position is better. So 1 Peter 2.24. Amen. Who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you will be, by whose stripes you are, by whose stripes you will be, by whose stripes you you were healed. So it's not me asking God, Lord, I am sick in my body. And Lord, I need you to heal me. No, it's Lord, I thank you, Lord, because I have been healed. It's no longer Lord, I'm believing you, Lord Jesus, for soundness of mind. It's no longer that. It's Lord, I thank you because I have soundness of mind. I no longer look forward to what God will do. No, 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 no. I go behind me and I look back at what God has done on that cross and I thank him because he has already done everything that I need. So it's no longer God. When will you settle this bank balance? It's Lord, I thank you because you have given me the investment for that bank balance to be settled. Lord, I thank you because I'm coming out of the red. I'm I'm out of the red. You have delivered me from being in the red. I'm back in the black. I'm back in the black. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, right now. Because I don't thank you in advance. I look back at what you have done. I thank you late because you have done it in the spirit. And I have it now. Somebody say, my position is better. Amen.
My position is better. Let me stand in one place because I'm making the cameraman's job a lot harder than it needs to be. My position is better. So I don't look forward to what God will do. I don't need to look forward because he has done it. He has done it. He has done it in Christ. And because I am in, I'm in him and I live as him, 1 John 4, 17, I live as him, I have all the benefits. I don't look forward to what he will do anymore. There is no more for him to do. There is no more for him to do. There is no more for him to do. It is the finished work of God that I'm residing in. There's no more for him to do. So I look back and I thank him for what he has written. Praise the Lord. What a great joy to bring you this message today. I trust that God spoke to your heart and I believe that the word of God you've heard will profit you, will prosper you, and will perfect all that can sense you in Jesus' name. For those who have not given their heart to Jesus, I want to challenge you to open the door of your heart to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior by praying this simple prayer with me. Dear God, I come to you today just as I am, a sinner in need of a Savior. Save me now. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I believe in my heart that you died for my sin. You were buried. But on the third day, God raised you up from the dead. Therefore, I am saved. You know, as simple as that prayer may sound, if you pray it from your heart, guess what? God heard you and you are saved. So I rejoice with you for this new beginning. I want to encourage you to find a good Bible-believing church where you can be nurtured and you can be helped in your work with God. If there's any way I can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to write me or contact the number on the screen and it will be my pleasure to respond to you. Well, until next time when I come into your home, you keep on winning because God is on your side. You are destined to win.